Well, that's because you can just exploit them and use them for whatever you want, rather than realizing, like with Baba, you know, you couldn't mess with Baba. Okay, when people were new to Baba, he would give his indulgence and love, anything he did was wonderful. But it didn't take long before you couldn't get away with that. You know, and if you tried to, you know, take advantage of Baba, you know, like that. And that's part of what's so wonderful about a master, because he really cares about you. He's not going to let you get away with this kind of bullshit. So let's see. Okay, nor follow. Yeah. yeah, here are some phony gurus. Nor follow those who close their eyes and behold themselves infinitely <laughs> desirable. <laughs> Haven't you met this type of one? And repeat the formulae of their own aims. Or breathe on the in breath, magnifying themselves. <gasps> on the out breath, exuding self stench. <laughs> Even the dumb earth swims in the perfumed breath of the perfect master. Now, now he's going to talk about artists. And book five, he really goes after artists. Nor dung your eyes and ears with pigments and words and sounds of seeming relation. See, dung your eyes with pigments, that's paint, right? And words and sounds of seeming relation, just like poetry. He, he really goes after that in book five about, you know, the poetry you saw around him in the painting. Blinding your eyes to the lovely model of man, your ears to his singing. Nor theories nor works will avail to imprint in your hearts the form and message of the perfect master. What yeah. is Christ a male model? Did he pose for He did. Art? Art. Yeah, for artists and uh, the uh, Yes, I, I sort of sensibly used that word model. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. He was he was a, a, a part of that whole scene. He was closely associated with uh, those who became the leading Australian artists at that time, in fact, in, in Melbourne, which was the place for them in those days. So he knew whereof he spoke when he was talking about all these things. Now, I'm just going to jump by reasons of time. Now, here, there's, there's a lot more in what we've jumped over, but now we come back. This is coming towards the end of this section, and he's back to this theme again, right? Unlearn your learning, unhope your hopes. Remember the new life, hopelessness and helplessness. Give up on your hopes. Unlove your loves. Nothingness is becoming. Do you know what it means, is becoming? Feeling, feeling suitable, appropriate. Is becoming. To those arisen from nothing. Right? Nothingness is becoming. To those arisen from nothing, that's us. Clear some ground for love. Love. The entire forgetter, the only rememberer, the chastener, and cherish. I think it should be cherisher. Let me see, I think this is from the, the internet version. I don't have time, but I think that's a typo. The perfect master. And seek the glorious one, thyself. You yourself are the glorious one. Remember yesterday with the, uh, you just talked about the stupid little house that you're, this me is built by me. He's saying, Master Architect, the, the one who built a stupid little house built the entire universe, you know? So he's saying, he's, this is the Advaita theme. This is yourself, actually. Thyself, unborn and undying, unfretted and undismayed. Thyself, creator of heaven and earth. This is you. The perfect master is your own real self. Unloved, unhated, but love perfect and existent alone in self. Thyself, in the form and being of the perfect master. So here he establishes the Advaita. You know what Advaita means? Yeah, non-duality. Not two. I and you are not one but one, says Nehubhava. It's actually only one is there, and the master is the real self, capital S, of the lover. Seek his love, or ever the dark wave shall bear you. Remember the dark wave? Those of you who were here yesterday, the dark wave of... Actually, it was last week. But um, the, the dark wave rises, and when, when its real nature is revealed, it's utter ruination. It's destruction of illusions. 
As soon as you buy into the illusions of moon path, when the sun arises, their real nature is exposed and you're destroyed. That's reincarnation. So, or ever the dark wave shall bear you in the fiercest sunbeat of days, the terrible loneliness of nights, nor flag nor friend to greet you. I don't know, when I read this, I say, this is the truth. This is, where we, this is what reincarnation does for us. It leaves us stranded. It never fulfills its promises. Utter night and the dark wave curling above you. Seek his, this is like a real warning there. Seek his love and forgiveness, while yet he is here in the form of the perfect minister. Clearing the ground, and now he's going to interpret this metaphysically. We haven't had this yet. Is erasing the impressions of the mind. Sanskaras. Impressions are the veils between ourselves and truth. I don't know, any of you who were here last week, remember the song of John Kerry, where he talks about veils and veils, remember that? It's right at the beginning. And um, it's the spearman, Francis and John Kerry, is being stabbed by the spear of the spearman, the beloved Baba, actually. And that's the annihilation of those impressions there. When they are erased, self stays in its native condition. Self, beyond God of love from where we once came, the hear God of redemption, in person, the perfect master. The perfect man, this is the 40th stanza now, and this is the, the coda, the 41st. The perfect master, the man God, who was a man who became God, who became a man. Okay, the perfect master, you ascend from the human state, you become God, and you return to man's state once again, right? This has been what we've had so far. The perfect master, who is God, directly descended. Now we're talking actually about the avatar. The, the avatar doesn't have to ascend. It actually comes straight down, it's brought down. Who takes the wheel of the world car, from the hands of the perfect master's number one driver. <laughs> Do you know who that would happen to be, by the way? Sai Baba. Sai Baba shared it, yeah. Yeah, he was the, kut, the Kutubi Irshad. Do you know the phrase, the Kutubi Irshad? Yes. The head of the perfect master's, yeah. There's always a head. But when the avatar comes, the Kutubi Irshad surrenders his charge to the, uh, to the avatar. So he's referring to that. Yeah. Uh, the word that you just said, the word airshot, is it the same as boat? Yeah. 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 Same as what? Boat. Boat. Is that the word? Boat. 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 Okay. Okay, I'm just saying it as a spell. I don't know how it's said in Arabic. It's probably... Same. Boat. 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 Okay. Boat. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the Sufis had that concept. There's a photo um, at all times, hidden, hidden people. Um, and you see the metaphor being used here, right? It's like Grand Prix racing. <laughs> Francis liked cars, apparently. He liked fast cars. So here he used I heard he put this in for someone else. Um, I don't remember who. Somebody around him who was really into cars. Like Francis was, who takes the wheel of the world car in the hands of the perfect master's number one driver and drives the new circuit and establishes correct lap, lap time. <laughs> Remember the discourse about the avatar where he retrues and shows the model of what, you know, per perfection of humanity. So here's using correct lap time. <laughs> of all perfect masters, the perfect master. The avatar is the perfect master of perfect masters. And now we get to avatar. The perfect master, avatar, who is none but God, who is everything, which contains the nothing, and his devotee. And let me ask this question, which I don't altogether have an answer to. Why is it about the perfect master, this whole book, rather than the avatar? He gets to the avatar. I don't know, I'm, I'm open to ideas on that. Because um, there's always a perfect master. master. Oh. There, a perfect master always exists. And the avatar doesn't. Mm. Because Bob didn't call himself the avatar until late in the game, so it's maybe that. That's true, too. Yeah, so, 
that the avatar doesn't exist. Well, I mean, the avatar is, is not in the body. Let's put it that way. In that yeah, sense. Right. <laughs> but the perfect ma- there are always perfect masters in the body. Mm-hmm. And when did he actually declare himself as the avatar? 1954, February. Mm-hmm. So that had happened before Francis got the order. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it also... He uses also- the word, he just doesn't. He uses perfect master more. Yes. Yes. And Baba had presented himself as the perfect master. And Baba is the perfect master, too. I mean, he is the master and he's the perfect one. He just happens to be the avatar, you know, beyond that. But um, I don't have it. I've got to put it in the slideshow. But it also occurs to me that this is, we don't have it here, do we? The tenth state of God. You know the tenth state of God and the tenth state of God? That's what they take things, that No, that's, uh, that's a different chart. That, that, that's in God speaks. That's the circles. Yeah, and the tenth, all those circles. And actually... The perfect master and the avatar both um, occupied our potential state of God. Both of them. Okay. I think he wanted to give perfect credibility to the perfect masters mm-hmm. that they have tremendous authority, the five. And so he didn't want this to take yeah. away from that. Right. So, like at the end of all perfect masters, the perfect master. Yeah, yeah. I, I know this. I mean, it intuitively makes a lot of sense to me. It's like all human. And Francis really. I mean, I think he was quite conscious that this book was going to be of perennial importance. And Baba indicated then that it would. And for the next 700 years, though, people will be you know, in search of the perfect masters. But at the very end of this, you get to the feet of the perfect master, now to the feet of the avatar. That last link, that last step is made going into book five. What's the avatar? Yeah. Yeah, for a hundred years time, yeah. The avatar is directly approachable. Yeah. I think uh, so the way he expresses certain matter is like it's to keep you aware that his brain is ever green and you have to keep it far open in the model. Yeah, that's right. All the time they are here. Always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you don't say, well, you know, Baba died 50 years ago. I've got to wait until he comes back again. No, he's perennially approachable. And of all perfect masters, the avatar is the perfect master. Yeah, yeah. So we just read some of the stanzas in this and looked at them kind of quickly, but you can see it's worth, in all of State of God, it's worth spending some time with each stanza and unpacking it, right? There's a lot, there's a lot in this. We've just been kind of skimming across the surface to tell the truth. Okay, why don't we move on to um, book five. You can see that the tone of this is, um, book four is kind of, Severe in a way. I mean, severe in the sense of completely frank, completely upfront. Yeah. You know, if you want to find the perfect master, if you want to get out of this and not have the terrible dark wave and the loneliness and her flag and her friend to greet you, if you don't want to find yourself in that position, you have to find your way to the feet of the perfect master. And you got to be fulfilled about it. No, there's no joking. So that's very much the quality of this book, especially. Um, of course, you know, it's quite consistent the entire thing. Now we come to book five. Oops, sorry. Which is uh, actually more than half the book is book five. More. While you're looking for that, can I just add something that really struck me when he kept saying perfect master at the end of everything? Yeah. How lucky was my mother? Because she and I had both been Rosicrucians, mm. and after seven years in it, they told her that I did the little kid stuff. Uh, they told her, We have taken you as far as you 
can go, as hard as we can go, you now need to find your own master. And mum says, 1952 in Australia? How the hell am I going to find a bath? <laughs> and the next day, a friend says, hey, there's this man that's just come back from having met someone he says is a mm. perfect master. He's God in human form. Yeah. So, I mean, my God, they tell her she's got to find a master, and she finds the perfect master. Wow. Wow. Whoa. Good of the Rosicrucians for having told her the truth. Yeah. About their own limits. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. 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 So, book five is um, more than half of the entire Stay with God is in book five. And it's actually in book five that we get um, where Francis really comes to the theme of the book. Now, I don't think I have here the table of contents in this slideshow, which I had before. Let's see if I do. No, I don't. So I'm just going to read it from here. Um, again, the table of contents is worth paying attention to, because Francis really explains um, the concept of the whole book. So now it's the God-Man as world axis. Koto, right? Yeah, I may not wind up saying right. I have the bad habit. They spell it Q-U-T-U-B, so... Sounds like Kutum. Sounds like Kutum. So, yeah. <laughs> so you'll have to translate <laughs> into Persian and Arabic. Okay. <laughs> so the God in his world axis. That's so Kutum. What does it mean in Persian and Arabic? It's. It's a perfect master. But I think it's literally an axis pole. Exactly. Yeah. North pole and south pole. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, so the world spins around the perfect master. Thus, you have Jalaluddin Rumi inaugurating the practice of the whirling dervish, and he would he would uh, spin around a, a pillar in his house. Rumi would. So. Uh, this clearly links to that, right? World access, Francis clearly has that in mind. Um, and living perfection of art. So art is going to be right at the center of the five. I'm going to say more about what that means here. Um, and the, the subtitle, The Divine Sun of Reality Shining Through the Mists of Illusion. Now, um, okay, so now this is quite uh, extensive. And I've just been showing the numbers uh, again. I mentioned before, uh, maybe last week, how many other very great artists gave great attention to formal symmetries, formal symmetries in the formal architecture. Great works like Dante is a classic case of that. And Bach uh, would do the same thing. I, I've heard that Bach, you know, Johann Sebastian, um, would actually be conscious of the number of measures his compositions. And when he came to the measure that corresponded to the golden mean, that would be marked in some way. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they're, these geniuses, you know. Would be like, so Francis was very conscious of the formal dimensions of this. So we just had, book three had 40 stanzas, right? Four sections of 10 each, plus one stanza coda for 41. And the one we just looked at, had one section with 40 very short stanzas, plus the coda. You saw the coda there, right? We talked about the perfect master of perfect masters, the avatar. Now this one has um, four parts, and each of them has 40 stanzas. So it's quite extensive, but you see the number 40. By the way, um, have you ever heard, seen the poem Meher Charisa? Yeah. yeah. By Kishab Nigam. And that's a standard form. Chalisa means 40. Mm -hmm. So I think this is, I, I would have to research this, but I think this is much used in Hindu devotional uh, literature. And of course, there's the Chila Nashini, um, where you um, sit in a circle for 40 days, as Baba's father, Shariar, attempted to do, staying awake and not eating. Right? Never. Huh? Chila Nashini. Nashini. 
40. Yeah, so there's the so 40 has a certain significance in uh, spirituality. So Francis uses it a lot. Isn't 40 a number associated with couples? I don't know. I don't know about that. I'm going to have to research number 40. I haven't really done it properly. Yeah. How do you think that rather than 40, you know, it's going to add age or age or age or age or age or It might be the case with Muhammad. Of course, with Baba, it was, it was very young. And Jesus, it was younger too, but with Muhammad, it, made, it was around then, I think. Mm -hmm. then also, Baba's father stayed in the service for 40 days and 40 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. Or he made it through 30. Yeah, he didn't quite make it, but that was, that was his goal. Yeah. If you do that, the tradition is, if you succeed, you have to stay in the circle. They always say not sleeping. I don't see how that's possible. And not eating. But they say that if you do that, anything you'll, anything you want will be given you. So Hafiz has uh, did that too. Actually, Korshed, I don't know if you know uh, Baba's disciple, Korshed, mm -hmm. friend of the... Uh, uh, so, is that going to be outdoors? <laughs> <laughs> yes! I think Korshed's dad tried to do it indoors. Yeah, he tried to do it too. And he had a vision of Lakshmi Devi that he did have vision of. Mm -hmm. Don't the Muslims have to go 40 times around? Seven. Oh, it's the seven. Kaaba. Oh, oh. oh. In the, yeah, when they go to Mecca and mm -hmm. they go around that. Yeah. I go to this 40 times around it. So here we have the number 40, and I know it takes a lot of readings of a poem as long as this is before you become conscious of it. But I'm one of those who has read this poem a lot of times. I don't know. I'm probably approaching 40, as a matter of fact. <laughs> you I look younger than 40? <laughs> and so there is very much a rhythm of the 40 stanzas. I'm very conscious of if you move through it. It's like a long Russian novel. You're aware of a you know, thing. There's a movement. There's a sense of a movement and inevitability. Uh, that gets established. And after that, there's a five stanza coda. And one of the things I want to be absolutely sure we do this afternoon before we close is read that coda because it's just magnificent the way he closes it. It really is. Um, now, in the course of this, then, uh, Francis is also using a 14 lines. Okay, yeah, know that. So you can see, we began with stanzas in the first book of seven lines. That's during the biography. Book two, the love song, was six lines, which I find to be an incomplete form. And I think it's suited for that because that's the problem the lover has got. It's like, the incomplete. The restlessness there is, is in that very form. The third book has ten line stanzas, and those are substantial. You know, this is in the State of God story. We just looked at the five line stanza, which is pum, 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 hammer, pum, pum, like that. Now, we're, the last one, 14, double what he had at the beginning, this is by far, by far the most expansive stanzaic form. And, uh, do you remember, what do you know about a sonnet? Poem? <laughs> 14? 14 lines. And uh, the Italian form, this is the Italian and Shakespearean form, but the Italian form is eight and six, eight lines and six lines. And Francis begins and closes Stay with God with Italian sonnets, actually, the sonnet form. So the, these are not all sonnets. They don't have the meter and they don't have the rhyme, but they do have that length. Also, um, after writing Stay With God, as Francis joined Baba, he began to write guzzles. And the guzzle form that he adopted was seven couplets, so 14 line uh, poems, all of them. Every guzzle he ever wrote, I, I believe, was a 14 line poem. So in the course of uh, this section, from time to time, he will go into something that looks a little bit... It's not that uses rhyme forms and reminiscent of a uh, sonnet or using 
the background of those conventions. Here he's doing one of his caustic uh, comments on modern life and the idiotic things that he's talking about how literacy is, uh, you know, it's better to be illiterate. Kumar Swami pointed out the spread of literacy is the decline of culture. We can all read, but what do we read? Somebody's killed somebody, or would like to, or some, someone's killed someone, or would like to. Someone's seen something we haven't, thinks we should know. <laughs> this tone, this sarcastic tone. And now he starts using, for this ridiculous subject matter, a kind of a rhyming scheme. Someone's invented a new gadget, or a new form of budget, or a different smell of soap, or a new cereal or the improved scope of radio aerial. Remember in those days, radio was the way of uh, mass communication. Or the odds of horses. <laughs> you say horses. Betting. 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 The odds of betting. Or some social behavior courses. Or other various kinds of anugial belching. <laughs> what do you suppose? What is a neutral belching? Farting. Farting. <laughs> belching through the anus. <laughs> no, that's what we read. A somebody's anus. <laughs> that keeps our feet squelching in a veil of mud across heart word in response. Now it becomes very bitter. And the soul dancing a jig or rock and roll, nuzzling a carrot suspended from the point. Now, who do you mingle carrots? Horses, donkeys. So, but from the point of a bayonet, right? The poor thing doesn't know that it's a bayonet. Right? It's horrible, actually. So he's actually talking about all this stuff is really, really has a you know cynical and hateful spirit behind it all. So it kind of ends in a very violent sort of way. Carrot from the point of a bayonet. But there's a case of his using sort of a hint of the uh, sonnet form. Here's another example of it uh, later on. There's a lot of very caustic stuff in this. Uh, yeah, that is when I was reading it. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a lot. Now here's where in place where he's starting to... He's, he's actually been talking about the contempt state of the world and about you know how dark and horrible it's become. And now this is like a appeal. Hmm? So nothing's changed since then. It's worse. Yeah. Oh, son. When will you break through the encircling night of our day? Cherish our hearts. Still, I know you can't see it here, but this is actually the sonnet form. A, B, A, although it's not an iambic pentameter. But he's echoing the uh, uh, rhyming scheme of the sonnet. Uh, gladness and set our feet dancing on your holy way. That, that, uh, that's a B rhyme, right? Blossom, your azure. O oh, sun. Burn with your diamonds our web of fears, not our tears. This is the Italian form, right? C, D, D, C. Alone, our full cup and measureless measure. Azure, measure. O oh, sun, earth is ripe for buying a new treasure. The heavens await a new study of instant pleasure of your life for you. When will you break our sleep and dreaming, our holy feet awake? This is actually the Shakespearean form, as a matter of fact. So here, I'm just giving you some formal devices that he uses. So from time to time, he'll use um, rhyming um, patterns and other things that are reminiscent of the sonnet form, because the length of the stanza uh, is the same as the length of a sonnet. He uses a lot of different styles in this. Uh, like here you see very short lines. Usually his lines are 14, 15. 16 syllables, something like that, a long line. It could have been just after he'd been reading uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley or Milton. I mean, he was into those British poets. He knew it very well. Yeah. He knew all that stuff. Uh huh. Yeah. And certainly Shakespeare, he also knew Milton, wrote great sonnets. Um, all of that. Okay, now. We have a little while still. Now, um, 
In terms of its subject matter and its form, I don't know what genre this would be. I would be very grateful to someone. I wasn't a, a scholar of modern literature, so uh, uh, it might be something people better versed in that could speak. I think Ross Keating could say a lot more. But one of uh, Francis's um, models in its own way uh, was probably Ezra Pound, who was the author of Cantos. I don't know if you know Ezra Pound. He was one of the uh, great founding figures of modern poetry. Uh, I think he died. Actually, you know Eric Solovaki. I don't know if any of you know Eric Solovaki. Mm -hmm. He actually knew Ezra Pound. Okay. Great line. Yeah. And Ezra Pound almost was completely silent. He had basically gone into complete silence. I think he felt his life was a player, actually. And Francis um, clearly felt that Pound was one of the figures who had a, a great possibility in him, but that he really blew it. He was very, I mean, he, he fundamentally failed. So he, re, he refers to Pound a number of times in the state of God. The Pound's cantos are the only thing I can think of most similar to Stay with God. His cantos are just like a book that thick of poetry. And um, it's, so to talk about what Francis is, is um, it's a, a great declaration of the theme of what art should be. True art, and we'll say more about art. It's not the limited idea that uh, most people would have about it. Um, and how art and culture and civilization has departed, completely lost its way, and departed from its real moorings, and how it needs to reconnect with God and stay with God. The whole civilization needs to be retrue. So it's a hell of a hell of a undertaking that Francis has embarked upon here to try to, you know, be true the whole civilization. By the way, I think I mentioned last weekend that uh, Wendy Haynes, uh, Connor, when I saw her in Myrtle Beach, we had a three-day uh, thing on Stay With God at the center of Myrtle Beach uh, in July. And after the first session, she uh, told me that Baba had told her mother, Jane, you know, Jane Haynes, Baba had told her that Stay With God would transform the world. So, I mean, it's an enormous undertaking that he's done here. And so part of it is establishing the parameters of what a true art would be and what a true culture would be and what true living is. And a critique of civilization, Eastern and Western both, and how it's fallen away from God. And a lot of what Francis is doing is caustic, you know, criticizing um, uh, departures and um, errors and delusions into which uh, civilization has fallen. And uh, really, he takes many of the great um, artists and uh, cultural figures to the wood woodshed and really gives them a whacking, you know, the including the greatest of them, you know, like Shakespeare, Mozart, and Michelangelo, all these people. I mentioned this last weekend. Um, for all their greatness, um, there was a departure from the, the you know, rootedness in God that is um, evident in the history of the last several thousand years. So there's a, there's a large cultural narrative um, that Francis has at the center of Book 5 that he goes through a whole bunch of different times. That's a big part of this book, yeah. Um, hearing that say that God is going to transform the world, uh, to your knowledge, are do people who aren't Baba lovers, uh, to scholars who are not Baba lovers, well, uh, should, uh, study say of God? No, I think it's very rare. It's very rare. I'm sure it will happen. When the world comes to Baba, this is going to, I mean, there's no other book in our Baba Library, anything like this. And I think this will give tremendous guidance as we start to deal with matters of culture. Yeah. Do you know if um, Francis read Allen Ginsberg? Um, I don't happen to know. Uh, it's very likely not, uh, because he went to join Baba in 1959. And between 1956 and 1958, Francis was really 
swamped and writing to stay with God. So I've never heard whether he did or not. Maybe later on he did. He was tough. Francis was tough. It wasn't <laughs> easy to... Uh, I, I heard... Um, after I got back to Australia, a lot of people would bring him uh, different 60s music, you know, like uh, Bob Dylan, and Francis was not impressed. He liked Led Belly. He liked Led Belly, yeah. Some of those traditional things. There's a great story of Francis. We should, you should get Dara to tell this, but uh, for Dara? Yeah. Running. And he was a, uh, I don't know, was he a teenager still in uh, the late 60s? Young man, anyway. And he was living in London with his dad, Adi. And, uh, <laughs> and um, so he went to see Baba, I think, when he was marrying um, Amrit. He was there for a month or two. And uh, I think he had been talking to Baba about the Beatles or whoever it was, because, you know, he was into that living in Britain, and I think his hair was a little bit long. And uh, so that was, of course, Francis's department, art, right? So Baba said she talked to Francis. <laughs> and <laughs> so, of course, Francis hadn't or heard the Beatles. He'd been living in Marizad and grew beside for the last 10 years. And, but uh, um, I think Dara got the idea that Francis, you know, would, you know, it would be less Beato Beatles than Beethoven or, uh, you know, the Ramayana. And so uh, Dara told Francis that he was very square. <laughs> and so how, here he was, this kind of guy who grew up in Melbourne in this revolutionary period. So I think when they went back to see Baba, Francis told Baba, he's, I can't do it, Australian. He says that I'm square. <laughs> this little whippersnapper telling Francis that somebody's square. After the life that he had led. Well, I think actually, it's a classic. Uh, 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 Dara did tell that story when he was here at our... Oh, he did? Yeah, he did. Because he went on to, to talk about the... I forget what what uh, group was it. There was an album that, that he received from... Was it from Bob? I can't remember. But it was uh. one of the, the, the him happening rock group, rock group set. And oh. I, I think... Uh -huh. uh, I think he did receive, no, it wasn't the who, it was somebody else, but yeah. he did receive that. We had um, our gentleman here, and some of the video changed, but it was hot, so it's in there. I uh, see. Because he did end up receiving um, an album that was sent to him, I think, I think it was from Baba, and it was uh, one of the happening rock groups of his time. I see. So Francis had heard that, or did Dara bring it? Uh, Dara told uh, the story. I say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But he said that Francis um, sang a song that he wrote and placed harmonium while doing it, and then, yeah. um, you know, sort of who brought me seconds, and Dara said, oh, I see you're square. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, Francis, it's, it wouldn't be a matter of being prejudiced against rock music or anything else. It's just he had a really uh, high standard. Yeah. One time, my, my first visit in 1971, Francis was in Marathon, mm. and you know, we sit out there with Pandu, and I had a cassette recorder. My goal was to record every Monday and also Francis. Yeah. I walk up to the microphone, I said, excuse me, sir, may I uh, have you say some words about your experience here? He says, young man, I don't speak with my tongue, I speak with my, uh, my hand. <laughs> and so he... <laughs> yeah, I heard that. He would often say, you know, read my poetry. And he really is in his poetry. I remember Gary Kleiner saying that he had gone up to Francis in the 70s and said, Francis, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, how much I, I really liked your poetry. And Francis said, ah, get out of here. <laughs> you know, just this sort of conventional bullshit. Is, I'm not going to get anywhere with him. <laughs> Now, one of the, the central idea to understand here is what Francis really means by art. And he doesn't mean just what people who call themselves artists do, you know. Actually, when I was, uh, you know, in academia, I started to, um, I was put off by kind of snobbery that I would see all the time. Well, I'm an artist, I'm a poet, you know, so, like you're just regular old people. Yeah. You know, so that kind of attitude is really put me off. Well, don't, Francis isn't, you know, 
propounding anything like that. Uh, what he really means is um, molding the material of your life, molding the, the world, the universe, in the likeness of the higher truth of God. And whoever does that is an artist in his sense. And in fact, the true artist is the, the avatar, who, who does exactly that, who is the perfect expression of divine beauty and glory. That's, our, that's what he means. And so like some of the stanzas, like at the, let me just read a couple of these, to give you an idea of this. Mm. Yeah. In fact, one of his themes, there's a, a kind of a theme, you might say, of the fall that's uh, central to this narrative. I'm going to talk a lot about the narrative of Book Five, how traditional, I, we don't have a good reference, I'll say traditional um, human cultures. Um, we have been rooted in one way or another in the divine. And in the last several centuries, modern civilization has fallen from that. So he retells that story many times about a kind of a severance. He said that, you know, in the past, from time to time, um, a culture, a society would deviate away, but always it got retrued and found its way back to a real connection within the divine. But for the last 500 years, it's been a black night, and civilization has really um, lost its way completely. And um, I mentioned on the very first day about this, Francis engages in a lot of really, really um, harsh criticism of different people here and there. And uh, <coughs> as I said then, I don't think, if, if you happen to disagree with his opinion on somebody, you know, this one or that one or this movement or that movement, I wouldn't worry about that so much. It's, he always has a point he's making, and he had a very acute eye. Um, like, I always mention Shakespeare, because I happen to like Shakespeare like so many other people do. But he said, uh, just going through, you know, the last 500 years and what's... Uh, it can be salvaged from the wreckage of modern civilizations. So he says, a handful of work of Shakespeare subtracting what he said from what he was paid to say. In other words, he was okay when he wasn't selling out, right? About the man you almost universally regarded as the greatest writer of the West, or at least one of the top three. Well, I know what he's talking about. I do. Um, Shakespeare wasn't... Um, you know, didn't have a, a spiritual divine concept that he was writing about. And it, there was a kind of a lot of crowd-pleasing involved in it. Now, I don't actually call that a fault in him, you know, but it does, what Francis really means to say is there was a turning away from the inner to the outer that has happened about that time. Instead of going in, the, you know, cultural enterprise went out. And that's how uh, the civilization lost its way. See, there really, and that really is, is true of Shakespeare. I'm not faulting the guy, he played his role. But it is true something that happened at the time, yeah. I would say that, <coughs> pardon me, Shakespeare's sonnets were much more spiritual than his plays, which were for the masses. But you know, I would have the same criticism of the sonnets, to tell the truth. Although they were more connected with them, they were Petrarch, but Petrarch was uh, also very much Renaissance. So there's a lot you could have to say about all of the particular criticisms that he has. But he's not speaking, even though he may be flippant and dismissive and caustic, and you might not accept an opinion of his, there are deep points that are really worth noting. So I would just say that about this whole book. Because he really takes the this, this stick to a lot of the greatest people of the uh, uh, greatest artists and cultural figures of the last thousand years. Yeah. Uh, 